want to tune in. Thank you. And at this moment in time, I am going to ask the illustrious Darla Ahrens from the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment and many other things in Colorado, Colorado related to recycling to introduce herself and launch into the presentation. Thank you so, so much, Darla, for making time to be here today. You're welcome. It's my pleasure, Liz. Thank you so much. And I am a big fan of celebrating successes in life, whether they're big or small. So thank you for queuing up that engaging and meaningful icebreaker conversation in the beginning. That was it's wonderful. I think also hearing about challenges really makes life interesting, right? Challenges make our lives interesting and overcoming those challenges makes life even more meaningful, especially when it's done in a collaborative environment like we have here. So thank you for that. That was lovely. Uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Darla Ahrens, and I am the Producer Responsibility Program Lead for the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. And today I'm going to give you a quick overview of Colorado's Producer Responsibility Program for packaging and paper products, uh, in case you're not familiar with it. But really the focus of today's meeting will be to provide you with updates on the statewide recycling needs assessment and give you a little bit of information about rulemaking. And then of course, we'll open it up to the best part of the meeting, which is Q&A. All right. So thank you, Liz, for mentioning uh, that it's Colorado Recycles Week. So first things first, I want to acknowledge Colorado Recycles Week. Uh, Governor Polis signed the proclamation declaring Colorado Recycles Week in November of 2020, really to raise awareness about the importance of sustainable materials management, resource conservation, reuse, recycling, all be critical elements in building a circular economy. So when I talked to Liz back at the beginning of the year about when the best time would be to present about EPR, I knew without hesitation that November was the perfect month to talk about the Producer Responsibility Program, which is in alignment with the governor's proclamation and that will also support this objective uh, of the proclamation. So I thought we could have a little bit of fun. I, it's been a while, a couple months since I've attended a snack and share. So I forgot about the half hour of engagement, but if you can scan this QR code, we'll just take a minute or two really quickly and have a little fun and tell us something that you're doing to celebrate America Recycles Day or Colorado Recycles Week. Darla, I think you gotta click on the link and take us to that other QR code. Yep. Okay, I just did that. Do you see it? We don't see it. You don't see it. Oh snap. Okay, one moment. I'm gonna have to exit out of my presentation mode real quick. I had to split the screen, so let me drag it over here. Perfect. There we go. Now. You can either scan the QR code or type in the URL into your browser. And you can do this from your phone or uh, from your computer. So it can be something as simple as reading an article about recycling. Maybe you posted on social media. Uh, Jandra, when you mentioned the event you hosted, that's a great example. Maybe you attended an EPR advisory board meeting. <laughs> All right, create a social media campaign to highlight recycle centers around Colorado. All right, media. I'm guessing that means like press release maybe. I uh, liked and shared more posts on social. That's good. I know I've seen some social media posts this week that were really interesting, talking about <clears throat> the history of America Recycles Day, starting out of the Texas Department of Natural Resources by two staff members there um, that eventually went on to form ARD, which was really interesting. Supporting local, tours of the Recycle Center, 
met new businesses and individuals engaged in reduce and reuse. That's fantastic. The reduce and reuse showcase. <clears throat> Okay, thank you. I was just curious. Uh, I always like to see what other people are doing to celebrate and raise awareness about America Recycles Day and Colorado Recycles Week. Um, so I can learn new ideas and um, just get inspired. So thank you for sharing. All right, so really quickly, I'll go over um, a little bit about our EPR bill in Colorado. I know a lot of you are probably familiar with it, um, but just in case we have some new members um, who might not be as familiar or if you haven't been able to attend all of our meetings. So this is a super quick like 10,000 foot look at uh, some key milestones and some components of our program in Colorado. And of course it begins with our bill passage on June 3rd of 2022. And I wanna mention that our EPR law in Colorado unlike the three other states who have implemented uh, or passed rather packaging and paper products EPR, our EPR scheme is uh, a little bit more traditional of an EPR scheme uh, with the producers having fiscal and operational responsibility. So it's what we call a full responsibility model. <clears throat> producers are required to provide funding and provide services that assist in responsibly managing covered products after the consumer use phase is over. Our act includes packaging and paper products, regardless of recyclability, that are consumer facing and that are intended for single or short term use and are used for the containment, protection, handling, or delivery of products to the consumer at the point of sale, <clears throat> including through internet transactions. So, as you can see from this photo, which is not meant to be all inclusive. Um, but it includes packaging material uh, such as paper, plastic, glass, metal, cartons, flexible foam, rigid packaging, or other materials or a combination of these materials. But it does not include any business to business or any industrial materials. So if you're interested in a more in-depth look at packaging and paper products, you can visit our advisory board March 2023 meeting. Uh, the recording is available on our EPR website and, and that link will be included at the end of the presentation. So speaking of the advisory board meetings, since our bill's passage in June of 2022, we have been very hard at work on development of the program and implementation of the law. And the next milestone was appointing our 15 member advisory board which is comprised of geographically diverse recycling experts from various aspects of the recycling and composting industry. And that was achieved in December of 2022. I wanna give a shout out to our advisory board members, which also includes our Madam Chair, Liz Chapman. They have been working tirelessly to review a lot of information and to provide incredibly valuable feedback to us throughout the entire needs assessment process. I know it's been a really heavy lift and they have certainly shown their strength. So big shout out to the advisory board. They're doing great work. The next major milestone was to appoint the nation's first producer responsibility organization who is Circular Action Alliance or CAA as you'll hear me call them or the pro, I will also call them. And we've had a lot of early successes. And in my opinion, this has been one of our biggest wins so far. It was definitely a historical moment for all of us that we celebrated. Um, the PRO has also been very hard at work as well since they were appointed in May and they are also doing a really great job. Another big milestone in our EPR implementation was completing our first Solid and Hazardous Waste Commission rulemaking, which was successfully promulgated by the commission on May 16th, 2023. So just this year, this rule regards the annual consumer price index adjustment for those producers with an annual total gross revenue of less than $5 million. So we look at the CPI every year and adjust that number up accordingly to the CPI. 
And in preparation for that rulemaking, we hosted a stakeholder meeting on the first proposed rules. That was in February of 2023. We had over 70 attendees registered and had a really engaged stakeholder input process um, for promulgating those rules. Then in August of 2023, uh, the state approved the third party contractor to conduct the statewide needs assessment. So CAA selected HDR Engineering, who then teamed up with Unomia Consulting, along with a whole army of local, national, and international consultants to complete this incredible undertaking. I'll go into more detail about the needs assessment next, but I would be remiss not to give a huge shout out to the consultant team working on this endeavor. They have been doing an incredible job of collecting an enormous amount of information in a relatively short period of time. So kudos to HDR and Unomia and CAA. Um, keep up the great work. The last, uh, oh, that last slide actually uh, serves as a good segue into the needs assessment topic. So I borrowed this timeline from CAA to show you a very abbreviated version of the timeline for the needs assessment. You can see here that the contract was executed in August and then the team immediately began information gathering, surveys, webinars, site visits, and a lot of other outreach. This work continued through about mid-October at which point they shifted into developing some high level findings uh, for the advisory board uh, to get some initial feedback. They also started conducting analysis on the data. They started modeling scenarios and um, started fact checking information that had been collected. CAA plans to continue presenting high level findings and consulting with the advisory board over the next month and then anticipates having a draft needs assessment report by the end of December. Although there is a little bit of time built into January for finalizing the findings after a 30 day public comment period with CDPHE. You can see on this slide, uh, the 14 main categories of study that the needs assessment covers. CAA has broken these out into what they call elements. And although these are categorized as such, it's worth mentioning that many of these elements are interwoven and Considerations will be made from data collected from multiple sources or multiple elements in order to develop recommendations and to build the projected scenarios. In blue font, you will see that these are the elements that CAA has already reported high level findings on to the advisory board. I don't have time to go into all of those details of each element today, but if you're interested, I encourage you to watch the recordings of our last several advisory board meetings where all of this information was shared and feedback was provided to CAA on these elements. This slide shows um, those last few meetings that I just mentioned with the advisory board where CAA presented high level findings on the first six elements of the needs assessment. Um, so that they're shown in green because they're already done. So again, those recordings are available on our EPR webpage, which will be linked at the end of this presentation. So one fundamental element of the needs assessment study is element eight, and it's the minimum recyclable list. One of many deliverables of the needs assessment is to propose a draft list of readily recyclable materials that would ultimately create a statewide universal acceptance list of recyclable materials. So it's kind of a big deal. <laughs> so we have successfully worked through the first two steps of developing that list, which is yet another huge success <laughs> in my book. Um, the first step was to develop material categories. The slide shows you the broad categories that the advisory board and CAA have consulted on and that CAA will move forward with. It includes seven primary categories, which are paper, rigid plastics, flexible plastics, metal, glass, compostable packaging material, and other categories or other material categories. Um, that includes things like wood, rubber, paint containers, HHW. And then there are several subcategories under each of these primary categories that I won't go into detail on today, 
but CAA will be issuing a public memo on these next week. And that memo and the detailed categories will be available on, on our website for public comment. We also talked about them in our prior advisory board meetings. And so those materials are available in draft form on our website. Then the second step in developing the minimum recyclable list was to determine which criteria with which to screen each of those material categories with. So the first broad set of criteria is statutory. So not a lot of room for changing that at all. It, it has, that is statutory and required. So then uh, CAA, well, first I'll mention it include the statutory requirements include availability of recycling services, availability of recycling collection and processing infrastructure and recycling end markets for covered materials. So you can see the statutory criteria is pretty broad. And so CAA then proposed a second methodology of criteria to further describe what is meant by each of these statutory criteria. And you'll see this here with the second methodology of criteria uh, on the first statutory criteria, um, we sort of combined the availability of recycling services with what was the second criteria, which was collection and processing. And so you'll see it combined here, and that was after a feedback and consultation with the advisory board. So on that first now criteria of availability of recycling services and collection infrastructure, CAA has added, are there any identified issues with collection? What is the availability of services to collect that material? Now, again, these are screens that each material um, category will be looked at um, to develop an output, which I'll talk about in a moment. Then for the second criteria, processing infrastructure, we have sortability, not only at single stream MERS, but what's the sortability at a dual stream MERF and what's the sortability with separate collections? Because you could have a material that cannot get sorted at a single stream uh, MRF, so it would it would be a no at a single stream MRF, but through a separate collection, it could ultimately be a yes. Then moving on to the third criteria of responsible end markets, uh, they further clarified, can it be sorted into at least one commodity with a responsible end market? Second criteria, what is the number of current end markets? And then lastly, on the fourth criteria, statutory criteria of potential detriments to the system, does it create any potential health and safety issues? Could the contents of the package, even if it's empty, create contamination issues or affect the end market? And lastly, is it considered a prohibitive in the commodity produced? So the criteria each have certain thresholds and markers that will then identify if the material is problematic, if it's concerning, or if it has no issues or maybe minimal issues. And so although CA is still in consultation with the advisory board until early next week, it does appear that we have a general green light with these criteria and sub criteria um, pending any additional feedback received in the next few days. So that said, the consultant team's next step is to start running the analysis of those proposed material categories through each of these screens you see here to determine what the output produces in terms of a material being determined to have minimal or no issues, in which case it would be recommended for the minimum recyclable list, or if a material is concerning and needs further consideration, or if a material is considered problematic and should not be considered, at least without further analysis. All right, I kind of did a deep dive on element eight there. So now I'm gonna circle back to the advisory board meetings and, and upcoming topics related to the needs assessment. So here's a snapshot of our next five scheduled advisory board meetings. Um, so although we do have preliminary data on the first six elements so far, we still have eight more elements to cover in the next month and a half. <laughs> so quite a bit of work ahead of us still. Um, this slide shows you our upcoming meeting, day, meeting dates uh, along with proposed topics for those dates. And of course, these topics are subject to change based on information received from the consultants as they put it together. But this is our best trajectory of 
when we expect to receive findings on these specific topics. So if you're interested in listening in, there is a QR code that I'll share at the end of the presentation where you can register for the upcoming meetings. And if the needs assessment piques your interest, um, there are several different opportunities to provide feedback. And that first begins with the pro. So CAA is technically managing their own feedback process throughout the needs assessment process. And there are a couple of ways to engage with them with the first being through to complete this interest form on that QR code. It's kind of more geared towards providing information for the needs assessment. But this QR code will also, signing up for the form, will also add you to their listserv to receive future updates from the organization as a whole. So that's helpful as well. Um, also to provide direct feedback on any specific needs assessment topic, I think the best avenue is actually to email Unomia directly at eprneedsassessment at unomia-inc.com. And feel free to copy me on the email if you don't want to send two emails um, with the same feedback. So I have a record of it, uh, but certainly not required. If there's something you just want to send directly to CAA, you certainly can do that. And then to engage with the state on the needs assessment, you have a few different options. First, you can register to attend our upcoming advisory board meetings that I just showed you. And during those meetings, there's an opportunity to provide feedback verbally to the board during the public comment period. Then after each of those meetings, uh, we accept public comments for up to 10 days, which worked really well when we had monthly meetings. But I will note that if you wait until the 10th day right now, it's likely that your comment will not make it to the board in time for their next meeting since the meetings are being held every two weeks now. And in our most recent case, um, they were held weekly the last couple of weeks. So I recommend um, sending your comments in as soon as possible after each meeting. And I also recommend being as specific as possible with your feedback by identifying the element that you're referring to and also include as many details as possible. It's really helpful. And then a second opportunity to provide feedback to the state regarding the needs assessment is during the 30-day public comment period. So this time frame begins after we have received the final needs assessment report and projected scenarios from CAA. We anticipate receiving this by the end of December, although it's not statutorily due until the end of January. And a notice will be sent out to our stakeholders as soon as that report has been published and open comment has begun. So if you're not on our listserv, shoot me a quick email and I can get you added to the listserv so you receive that notification of the 30-day uh, public comment period. And again, similarly to sending an email, please be as specific as possible in your feedback, um, referencing specific elements and including as many details as possible this really helps us organize all the comments that we receive and, and helps us identify any themes that might be rising to the top that we need to pay particular attention to in greater detail. And then outside of those two specific feedback opportunities for the needs assessment, if you have more general feedback to give us, you can utilize our public comment form, which uh, you can find by scanning the QR code here or you can visit our EPR webpage and just scroll down to the very bottom of the main EPR webpage and the link is there as well. And then we of course have good old fashioned email where you can just submit your comments to us um, at eprcomments at state.co.us. And before I close out for today, I wanna to give you a brief um, update on our rulemaking. So I'd already mentioned earlier the CPI rule, which was promulgated in May by the commission and became effective on July 1st, 2023. So even though we did complete this rulemaking, it's actually a rule that we'll be updating every year. So, but now that it's drafted, it will be a simple math calculation. So it should be a fairly straightforward rule to adopt each year, but you'll be seeing it on an annual basis. And then over the next six months, we anticipate developing and presenting rule concepts for what we're calling the primary regs. 
And this includes rules uh, for the producers, the pro, and all of the general provisions of the program, including definitions. And then moving closer to 2025, we'll develop and present rule concepts for the eco-modulation bonus schedule. And if you're not familiar with eco-modulation, it's essentially an incentive and malice fee schedule to encourage producers to manufacture more sustainable products in packaging. And so our statute is specific on five different areas uh, where producers are incentivized. So creating a product that has a high recycling and refill rate that designs for the reuse and refill of that material that has high levels of post-consumer recycle content that has innovations and practices to enhance the recyclability or the commodity value and that has reductions in the amount of packaging materials used for products. And then on the malice side, where producers will see a higher cost, uh, those factors are designs and practices that increase the cost of recycling, reusing, or composting, uh, designs and practices that disrupt the recycling of other materials, and lastly, using covered materials that are not on the minimum recyclable list. And lastly, here are some upcoming key milestones in our program. And I'll note this timeline is certainly not all inclusive, just some of the highlights. Uh, we start with the needs assessment, which is due in January. Then on or before March 15th, the department will submit and present the needs assessment to the Joint Budget Committee, identify the projected scenarios, and make a recommendation as to which projected scenario the plan proposal should incorporate. If uh, next on the schedule is if a producer or a group of producers wishes to operate in their own plan outside of the PRO under what we're calling an individual program plan, they need to let the state know by January of 2024. So then throughout 2024, the PRO will be developing the plan proposal, individual producers will be doing the same in consultation with the advisory board and that includes the development of the cost formula for reimbursements to service providers. Uh, then next we have the, the producers have to join the uh, PRO by June of 2025 or be operating under that individual uh, program plan that's been approved. And then lastly, we anticipate the final plan implementation in January of 2026. So this is the end of my presentation for today. Here's my contact info. I'd love to hear from you. And I'm also happy to take questions now if anybody has any. Thank you. You want me to take that down, Liz? Um, let's leave it up for just a couple more minutes so okay. everybody gets a chance to capture that. I know okay. you have a question since no one okay. raised their hand. So raise your hand or come off your microphone to ask Darla questions. I was wondering if you could um, clarify the difference between the materials that are being assessed and the materials that will be designated for the uh, readily recyclable list. Okay, the materials, so... I'm not sure I fully understand your question, Liz, but I think so the the materials that are going to all materials will be assessed a fee, but a subset of those materials will be on the readily recyclable list. So just because you pay a fee does not guarantee that your product will be readily recyclable. But that's correct. Have to pay a fee. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. So. It Kind of circles back to what I mentioned in the beginning of my presentation of under our EPR law, covered materials include packaging and paper products, regardless of recyclability. And so it includes, you know, the paper, the metal, the plastic, the glass, all the different varieties. Um, and so in order to make a determination of what should be moved over to the minimum recyclable list, we had to create that initial material category list uh, 
just to try to capture all the different products and packages that are covered under the program. So the material category list is, is a broader representation of all of the covered materials that uh, of producers that will be paying fees. Now, we, we did have some conversation uh, about the initial list had some materials on it that are technically considered covered materials, but they're also considered exempt through the program. So I'm thinking of, of like the paper towel example. And so under our bill, paper towels are or not, they don't call out paper towels, but they say any product that can be deemed unsafe or unsanitary would then be exempt. And so there was a question of, well, it's covered material, but then it's exempt over here. So maybe we should take it out of that material category list so as not to cause confusion um, on that initial list. So we're kind of sifting through the material categories with that that lens now. Um, okay. But overall, it's it's supposed to be, it's intended as a catch-all list of all covered materials um, without being specific to a specific product or a specific package or a brand, uh, but really thinking more in terms of creating commodities out of different material categories and, and kind of how industry standards uh, look at the different commodities and basically how they're processed and sold. You know, I, I see Ringa has got his hand up and Michelle has come off the mic. So Ringa, go ahead with your question and then we'll go to Michelle. Yeah, so um, hi, Darla. So hi. I'm Ringa. Uh, I'm a zero waste consultant. So I have a question on the eco-modulation part. So uh, it's great that we have eco-modulation for all these categories, but is there any consideration of a hierarchy, it's like for example, the ZWIA, the Zero Waste International Alliance hierarchy list, rethink and redesign as the highest and best use and then followed by reduce and so on. So the higher up the hierarchy, would the incentive be greater or is it just uh, kind of equal? That is a great question, Ringa. And we haven't had that conversation yet. Uh, the statute does call out that there are to be incentives for those types of, of products and packages. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't specify a hierarchy at this time. And so that will be a conversation I, I look forward to closer to 2025. Um, we'll get into those details and I encourage you to, uh, come to our meetings and, and provide us with that feedback. It, it's great uh, to hear this type of information. I didn't realize uh, as we had a, a hierarchy in that way. I know EPA does. Um, so the more, more information we have uh, in that process, the better. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Darla, uh, you want to stop screen sharing now that we're into the okay. conversational portion of our presentation. Thank you. I think yeah. you gave everybody a chance to write down your contact information. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, I all thanks. Jump thanks, in. Liz. Um, Darla, that was amazing. Um, I've learned so much. So my question has to do with that. How do we keep the public or, or at least the businesses that have products engaged and worked along the process so they understand the intricacies and are providing valuable input and not waiting till it's all designed saying, hey, you forgot about this. What's the public engagement and the communication plan? Mm -hmm. That is a great question, Michelle. And CAA, who is our producer responsibility organization, they have their list serve. We have our list serve. They're sending out press releases. We're sending out press releases. We share information at our advisory board meetings. They share information at their advisory board meetings. They host a series of webinars. Uh, the state hasn't held webinars per se, but I, I have done, I, I, I should have counted. Um, I'm sure I've done a couple of dozen at minimum presentations over just over the last year, maybe more. And I'm happy to show up to talk to any group. I know Recycle Colorado, as Liz mentioned at the beginning, um, did kind of a road show and tour. And uh, we, we've spoke at, at several conferences and 
I don't know a, about particular business outreach uh, specifically to businesses. I guess it depends what kind of business you're talking about. So if you're talking about uh, a product manufacturer as a business, there's certainly been outreach to, they're, they're considered producers and obligated parties in some cases under our law. So there has been direct outreach to what we would call a producer uh, because they will be directly impacted and we want them to have as much information as possible and understand and get involved. Um, there is a specific exclusion on the retail side. So if it's a retail business that you're talking about, they will have very little impact. Um, and so I guess it depends on the kind of business, but we also look to all of our partners through Recycle Colorado, through NAMA, through our local governments, through our nonprofits to help share the information. And in fact, whenever we send out emails um, on our listserv, we ask that in every email, please share this with others, put it in your newsletters, put it on social media, because we're only, you know, I, we're a staff of one on this program at the state level. <laughs> and uh, so there's only a, so much we can do. And so we really are hoping this can be a collaborative outreach effort. Can I ask a follow-up question? Yeah. Um, so given that, which is, I, I, your job is really tough. <laughs> um, <laughs> how are we going to handle new businesses that want to come into Colorado? And two, could we utilize the university education system to put a class on EPR to reach the business school students, the engineering students, the, the, um, the, the manufacturing level students and professors. Yeah, I think that's a great suggestion, Michelle. And it brings to mind for me, the PRO has requirement to develop a statewide education plan and distribute that plan and, and the resources and basically to provide those education services um, to the entire state. So also to the local governments. And so local governments can choose you know, to move forward with their own education plan if they want. They, they won't be required to use this, but the PRO is required to put together this plan and provide the resources to whoever wants to use them. And I think when we get to that point in the plan development, uh, if you could show up and provide that feedback to the pro and to the state, uh, I think it's a great idea. Yeah, I think there's something, I've noticed that over the years, because I used to manage the education and outreach uh, contract for Boulder County and and it really focuses on elementary kids, which is great, but there's been a, a real need to keep that education going. And it has grown into the middle schools and into the high schools, but, but even beyond there into the higher education um, institutions, I think it's so important. We have a lot of students that transfer into Colorado that aren't familiar and didn't get the, the training in elementary or primary schools. So I like that idea. Thank you, Darla. Thank you for those questions, Michelle. Are there any other questions? Does anybody else have any thoughts? So I have a question, Darla. Mm -hmm. You talked about the 30-day uh, comment period. Mm -hmm. And as I understand it, that 30-day comment period is a time for the public to make comments to CDPHE, is that correct? That is correct. And then that will be incorporated in, into uh, CDPHE's presentation to the Joint Budget Commission when they're making their final, they, they will consolidate the public feedback and make that part of their presentation when they say this is what we want to do next. My understanding is that it's, it's the significant, if any significant changes were made based on the feedback. Is there an opportunity for anyone interested to engage with the Circular Action Alliance prior to that 30-day comment period? Absolutely. Yep. And what does that look like? If you send out, you're sending out this presentation, right? Yep. 
Okay, so in there, there's a link with a QR code that takes you to their general interest uh, form. And, and that can serve two purposes. One is you can provide clarifying information on the needs assessment through that form. And it also adds you um, to receive notifications and, and get involved um, in their own meetings. And then the second is there's the EPR needs assessment at unomia-inc.com email that's on that slide. And that is the email they are requesting for direct feedback to come through on the needs assessment. You can also, if, you, if you're not really an email person or a form person, um, you can certainly give them a call and, and talk to them over the phone. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And, and then another question that has come up for me that I'm not sure you will have an answer for, but I'm passing this question along, is several of the governments that are currently contracting for waste services are curious about how reimbursement is going to look once the program is up and going. Mm -hmm. That will all be developed over the next year uh, with the development of the proposed program plan. And so one of the key elements of that proposed plan is the cost formula for reimbursement. And so Generally speaking, uh, if a local government is contracting for the service, um, they can choose to continue with their own procurement and then request for a reimbursement. And that reimbursement, the statutory language says, is for the net cost of providing recycling services. And that includes collection and processing and education. And so it includes all of that in that net cost of recycling services. And, and that's all the statute really says right now. And so it's going to be a, a, a interesting um, project for the advisory board and the, and the pro to consult with one another in the development of that cost formula. And if I understand it correctly, that reimbursement that will be determined as the program plan gets developed, will apply to whether it's a drop-off program or a curbside program or a mm -hmm. combination. Correct. And uh, could you speak a little bit about the difference between the scenario that's being developed in early 2024 versus the program plan, which is being developed throughout 2024? The projected scenarios, they're actually working on developing those right now. And so CAA kind of explained the basic uh, fundamentals of how they're putting together the projected scenarios um, a couple of meetings ago. So they're taking the different elements from the needs assessment. So looking at the costs, looking at infrastructure and capacity, um, looking at contamination, looking at availability of services and demographics and all of those 14 categories that I went over earlier um, through the residential lens and the non-residential lens. And then putting together projected scenarios. The statute says a minimum of three. If they certainly can come back with more than three and I'm sure they're working on more than three. Uh, just so they can wrap their own minds around what the best three to bring forward are. That projected scenario um, that the, I, I should say the projected scenarios that they're working on will include targets. And so they have to have collection targets, they have to have recycling rate targets, and they have to have post-consumer recycle content targets. At minimum, those three targets are required by statute. The targets are for 2030 and for 2035. And so they're taking all of this information they've gathered about availability of service, existing infrastructure, contamination, tonnages, um, and then identifying the targets and then running modeling to see what investments would we have to make to meet these targets by 2030? What investments would we have to make to, to meet these targets by 2035? And sort of building out a progression 
of um, advancement of the services and infrastructure throughout the state because it can't all happen in 2026 as much as we want it to. It's, it's gonna have to be a, a progression of um, investments that they make over time. And so those scenarios will give us different options to look at to achieve the targets that they've identified. Now, then we, we take, the department takes um, one of those three or more scenarios to the JVC as our recommended projected scenario. And we don't do that in a silo, we do that in consultation with the advisory board and CAA and bring that forward to the joint budget committee. And then whichever scenario is approved by the joint budget committee, and it doesn't necessarily have to be the one that the department brings forward, they have the option of, of choosing something else. But whichever scenario is approved, then CAA is obligated to build the program plan based on that projected scenario that's been approved. Thank you. So um, it sounds like the scenario is narrowing in more than we are right now, but still a very broad set of parameters. And then the program plan will start to dig into exactly what it looks like and what kind of rules will need to be promulgated for the program to move forward. Is that accurate? It, we, the program plan will get into all the nuts and bolts and all the specifics and we'll identify sites and uh, yeah. Correct. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I have been hogging all the question time, so I will pause again and make sure any of our attendees, do we have any questions, comments? I don't see any more questions or comments, so I, unless there's anything that occurred to you, Darla, do you have any last, any remaining, any last minute things you wanna add? Just thanks for having me. And if, if any questions come up after we end this uh, meeting, feel free to reach out. I'm always happy to talk about EPR. Well, thank you so much, Darla. Thank you. I'm uh, some applause and thank you. It was great. Uh, we are going to stop the recording and hang out for a few more minutes with some Recycle Colorado announcements. <laughs>